a new rabbi takes over a synagogue. And everything's going reasonably well. <laughs> it's already a Jewish joke. <laughs> Except every time they come to the Shema, half of the people stand up and the other half sit down and they keep arguing with each other about what the right thing is to do. And it doesn't matter how much the rabbi talks to them, he can't get them to change their minds. So he has the bright idea of going to the old rabbi and finding out what to do. So he goes to the old rabbi and he says, how's it going? Talk about this and that and the other thing. He says, but listen, there's one thing I gotta ask you. He says, every time we come to the Shema, half the people stand up. Is that the tradition? And the rabbi goes, no, no, that's not the tradition. He says, oh, well, the other half sit down. So that's the tradition. The rabbi goes, no, that isn't the tradition. He says, well, look, half of them are standing up and half of them are sitting down and they're fighting with each other. And the rabbi goes, that's the tradition. <laughs> Keep that in mind for a minute. This morning, we read the Akedah. The Akedah is the most commented on 20 verses in all of literature. And you can understand why. I mean, God comes to Abraham and says, this new child that I promised to you, I'm paraphrasing, I want you to take up to the mountain and slaughter as an offering to me. And the Akedah has received endless kinds of interpretations. So I remember Simon Greenberg in rabbinical school, his interpretation of the Akedah, which follows a long tradition, I don't know that there are any new ones, was that in, ancient, in the ancient Near East, sacrificing children to gods was not an unusual thing to do. We've actually found altars where pagans would sacrifice children to their gods. And the whole point of this was to show that God was not the kind of God that would do that. And the only way to do it was to demand it and then say no. That's one interpretation. Another is that God wanted to know that Abraham had the same level of devotion as people who would do it. And the only way to find out was to ask him to do it and then stop him. But there are questions also about Abraham and Abraham's character. Why did Abraham do it? Or at least why was he ready to do it? So first of all, if he was ready to do it, and I will come back to that, we know that it isn't because he wasn't willing to challenge God or that he didn't have courage because remember last week when God is about to destroy Sodom, Abraham argues with him and says, Will the judge of all the earth not do justice? Takes a lot of guts to yell that at God. So it isn't that Abraham doesn't have the courage. So why doesn't he challenge God here? Is it because it's a direct command to him? Is it because he believes God has given me a child? God has the right to take it away. Just like we say at a funeral. Hashem Natan, Hashem Lakach. God is given, God is taken away. Maybe he thinks, look, Isaac doesn't really belong to me anyway. Isaac belongs to God. So if God decides he wants Isaac back, he can have Isaac back. Maybe. This is like the beautiful Talmudic story of Bruria, one of the few women quoted in the Talmud who lost two children. And when her husband came home, the way she broke it to him was she said, somebody came and gave me two valuable jewels. And today they came and asked me for them back. Should I give them back? And he said, of course, you have to give them back. And she said, they're upstairs. So maybe that was Abraham's philosophy, was you have to give back what you've been given. Or, and some people say this, maybe Abraham all along didn't really think God was going to do it. Because he says to the boys who travel with him, the sort of helpers, the aides, he says, we are going to go up the mountain and then we will return to you. Now, maybe he just said that because he didn't want to say, we're going to go up to the mountain and I'm going to kill Isaac. I'll be right back, which would not have gone over well. But maybe there was a part of Abraham that knew that this trial was a trial. Maybe. 
And what about Isaac? Why does Isaac go along with it? Again, is it an act of faith or does he not believe that his father would really do this? We don't know. And why would God ask it? And on and on and on. Remarkably, this story, with everything else that's already in it, is also the first story that mentions love in the Torah. When God says, take your son whom you love, Asher Ahavta, the first mention of love in the Torah is actually not a man and a woman. It's a parent for a child. Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, said that his problem with the story, which is a tough problem, I've got to say, is how did Abraham know for sure that he was hearing God's command? He says, how can you go off and be willing to sacrifice a kid on the basis that you heard God when you could be mistaken? You're a human being. Human beings can make mistakes. Maybe it wasn't God. That's a tough one, too. Although, obviously, the Jewish tradition assumes that Abraham knows when God's talking to him. Now, I could go on and tell you 20 other problems that people have with the Akedah, but you get the idea. There's a lot of discussion and a lot of argument about this story. So here is a different theory about why God created the Akedah so that we would argue about it. Stick with me for a second here. When you argue about the Akedah, then you start arguing about what does God intend and what does God not intend? And how should human beings listen and how should they not listen? And what should you be ready to do and what should you not be ready to do? And how much should you trust yourself if you think you hear a voice and how much should you not trust yourself? We wouldn't ask ourselves those questions this morning if there wasn't the Akedah. The good thing about half of them standing and half of them sitting is they argue about what you're supposed to do when the Shema comes along. Since all of us sit, we don't argue about it and so we don't think about it. But an argument, L'Shem Shamayim, for the sake of heaven, is an argument where you discuss deep issues again and again and again, because after all, this is 3,000 years ago and we're still arguing about it. It's not easy to create a story that gets people arguing 3,000 years later. And every discussion of it brings up these deep theological issues about what it means to be a parent, what it means to be a child, what it means to be a spouse. Because remember, Sarah isn't told about this. Nobody comes to, Abraham doesn't come to Sarah and say, listen, I'm gonna take Isaac, sacrifice him, be back for lunch. And I'll see, actually it's three days, so that's not true. But Sarah dies right after the Akedah. And so the rabbis say, maybe she heard about it. And maybe that's what precipitated her death. We don't know, but we're still arguing. We're still arguing. And so you have to have a tremendous appreciation, whatever your opinion of the Akedah, if you think Abraham shouldn't have done it or should have done it, or if it was this great moment which is how the tradition sees it, of faith in God, however you see it, you have to admire the fact that it still provokes thousands of years later, that it still makes some stand and some sit and everybody argue. For Jews, that's a good thing. Shabbat Shalom.